Boston Mayor Michelle Wu here to welcome you to the 2023 Ginger Forum. I have always been grateful to the Giles and Diabetes Center for the work you do to combat diabetes in our Asian American community. Last year, I had the opportunity to join you for a taste of ginger and was moved by the center's commitment to this urgent life-saving work year after year. Just as discussions about health and communities of color demand cultural sensitivity, medicine for Asian Americans requires culturally relevant care. That's why I'm so excited about the Ginger Forum. It's spaces like this that are doing that critical work of making meaningful progress to ensure our communities are safe and comfortable when receiving life-saving care. I am so grateful to Giles and Diabetes and the AADI for holding this space and working tirelessly to raise awareness and improve care for Asian Americans living with diabetes across the city, Commonwealth, and country. I hope you all have a productive and insightful time at the Ginger Forum. As a South Asian, I've had the pleasure and honor of uh, being part of the AADI since its inception. And uh, I also want to let uh, um, uh, Leverett know that I had the opportunity to meet your dad several times uh, during his um, uh, visits to Jocelyn. And I still remember his very congenial and kind personality and his philanthropy for Jocelyn from the very beginning uh, when he arrived here. And I think his DNA percolates through you, continues to percolate, and that uh, you have provided us so much uh, leadership in AADI and the philanthropy that you have provided, so thank you. So George told me that it's going to be six minutes for each speaker. So yeah. I'll be keeping my remarks very short. And he asked me, to talk about some experiences with uh, Asian Americans, how to improve the risk of cardiovascular issues. So this is a tall order for me to do it in six minutes, but let's get going. Uh, as you all know, most people who come for care anywhere for diabetes, the most important worry they have is the complications. And of course, the diagnosis is important, uh, there was a recent paper published in Journal of American Medical Association in Chinese uh, people in China, 200,000 people studied. Only 30% knew they had diabetes. And of those who knew who had diabetes, only 35% or so were getting treatment for diabetes. So this is the scope of the problem. It's a global epidemic, pandemic, uh, which we've forgotten about sometimes, but I mean, we have to diagnose people with diabetes, number one, and diagnose them not when they have diabetes, but when they have pre-diabetes. And that's another 500 million people on top of 500 million people who have diabetes globally. And so that's the extent of the problem. So it's a huge problem. And out of the 500 million with known diabetes, about 300 million people are Asians. Think about that, more than 60%. And this epidemic or pandemic is not abating, it's actually getting worse. So here is very quickly, the complications you worry about, number one, cardiovascular disease. I'm mainly talking about type two diabetes, but also in type one diabetes. Uh, two to four fold increased risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease, diabetic neuropathy leading to foot ulcers and so forth. Then the huge problem of diabetic retinopathy, which thank God we are doing much more with now with latest treatments beyond laser treatment, preventing diabetic macular edema and so forth. Kidney disease, one out of three people with diabetes get kidney disease, type one or type two. And it can be detected years before it becomes a problem by simple examination of uh, looking at urine albumin, for example. Periodontal disease, and uh, you name it, almost every part of the body, increased risk of cancer. I didn't even put it on this slide. So it's a huge problem. So I'm just going to say a few words about two of the major risk factors for complications given this very limited time. So as George asked me to talk about lipids, so what are the major considerations that we all need to be aware of? The most important factor, besides of course nutritional and exercise uh, issues we talk about, is the something called LDL, low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Lower the better 
Okay, people always ask, how low should I be? There's a lot of evidence. We have so much recent knowledge and from clinical trials in thousands and thousands of people that everybody with diabetes should have LDL cholesterol less than 70 at the minimum, okay, to prevent cardiovascular outcomes, especially people above the age of 30, okay? And um, if you have heart disease already, most of us now feel in the lipid field, not yet part of all the guidelines, that it should be less than 55 if you can do it safely. And it can be done. How do we do it? Diet alone, unfortunately, will not be enough. No matter how strict your diet is, I'm talking about long term, you got to take this pill called statin. Statins have been around since 1987. Okay, the discoverer of the statin uh, hypothesis, uh, two of them got Nobel Prize. And uh, so there, there are seven of them and they're all cheap. Six out of seven are generic. So there's no excuse not to take statin. There are people who cannot take it or they cannot get to the goal with even high dose statin. Then there are so many other new options all in the past 10 years or so. Uh, one is a pill, another one is a pill and one is a biweekly injection. So there is no excuse to not be able to lower LDL cholesterol in most people, okay? That's point number one. Then people ask, what is this triglycerides? You know, everybody talks about cholesterol. When you talk about diabetes or pre-diabetes or overweight people, even before they get pre-diabetes, they have high triglycerides. This is another type of lipid in the blood that circulates. And it's very different than LDL cholesterol. But the most important point is part of triglycerides actually is cholesterol. If you know your triglyceride divided by four, and you know you have additional burden of risk of cardiovascular disease if you don't control triglycerides, particularly in people with diabetes. The goal is less than 150, and it's, the treatment is a little bit different than cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. You know, weight management, exercise, reducing carbohydrate, George, if you have high triglycerides, some, some restriction in carbohydrates will help and improve glucose control. The A1C, less than 7% is the goal, maybe lower in some people. The only drug I can talk about and with certainty for which there's evidence, millions and millions of people take drugs called fibrates around the world. They don't help cardiovascular outcomes, unfortunately. Lowering a number doesn't mean that you'll have the result that you're looking for. So the only drug is a fish oil capsule by prescription, because you have to take a certain dose. And that's the pure uh, icosapentaenoic acid, EPA, uh, which has been uh, approved by the FDA and other um, agencies, other guidelines. We were part of the study where we showed that EPA in the right dose will lower the risk on top of statin if you have high triglycerides, okay? So people who have heart disease or have high risk of heart disease, uh, if the triglycerides are high, if the diet and exercise won't do it, then you have to try taking this pill. It will help. It will help. And people always say, well, what about HDL cholesterol? You know, Framingham study was the first to show the HDL is a protective factor. Epidemiologically, yes. HDL cholesterol tends to tell you that maybe you have a lower risk, but there is no such drug. Uh, that you can use to raise HDL cholesterol and there's no benefit of using a drug. Many of you probably know there was a drug called niacin, there still is, which lowers uh, triglycerides. And two recent very well done trials show it doesn't do anything to your cardiovascular outcome if you are already on statin, that's the key. So those are many of the aspects that uh, somewhat new that we've learned from recent trials is to when to use a medication and when not to use a medication. And uh, for LDL cholesterol, um, Frank knows more than anybody else, they were the first ones to show in the Harvard School of Public Health that uh, switching from saturated to unsaturated fat and doing few other things are very important in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease with diet. And we'll hear a lot about nutrition later on. I want to say a couple of words about blood pressure. <laughs> Okay, one minute. Uh, blood pressure should be measured at every routine clinical visit. I think I don't th think I have to tell you 
for those of you who are into diabetes. And uh, if the blood pressure is over 130, over 80, it should be confirmed using multiple readings. And the best way to do it is check your own blood pressure at home. We always recommend that. That's more important than getting it in doctor's office. The white coat syndrome can raise your blood pressure. And the latest guidelines now say, the goal is not 140 over 90, but less than 130 over 80, particularly in people with diabetes. So I'm going to end by just showing one more slide. This is a, a very nice slide uh, put together by the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, that there are four pillars to reduce complications that we need to be aware of. I already talked about blood pressure and lipids. Glycemic management, we'll hear much more about from Dr. Mehta next. And, um, and there are new drugs. This is a fascinating phenomena that we're very fortunate that in the past 15 years, we have specific drugs that were originally approved for sugar control, but have major effects on preventing heart and kidney complications. Just think about that. I mean, cardiologists are now so excited, they are becoming diabetologists <laughs> because they keep using these drugs even when it's not you know, immediately necessary. Of course, the foundation is lifestyle modification and diabetes education. As Dr. Jocelyn said, a patient who knows the most does the best. So with that, I want to thank you very much. Thank you, uh, I was instructed only two minutes <laughs> because uh, to allow for a question and answer. So I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, I'm a generalist OBGYN at Beth Israel, as well as South Cove Community Health Center, um, where we serve a large Asian immigrant population um, and have been there for nearly 20 years. Um, so gestational diabetes, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak on today because uh, pregnancy is often a, t a time where we have a uh, a window into the future of someone's health. Um, and so just as you were uh, speaking doc about trying to diagnose prediabetes, sometimes pregnancy is a time where we can uh, identify prediabetes. Um, so uh, gestational diabetes, just like diabetes has been increasing in our country um, for all pregnant women, but especially for Asian Americans. Um, in general, it's 8%, but for Asian Americans, 15 to 20%. And for certain subpopulations, uh, Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, uh, Thai, Vietnamese, especially on the higher side. Um, and so why is it so important to screen for diabetes in pregnancy? Uh, we do know that gestational diabetes can have adverse outcomes in pregnancy. Uh, babies can be larger, make it more difficult to give birth. Um, we may have be associated with uh, more operative deliveries, cesareans, blood pressure issues, as well as um, uh, effects to the neonate. So, but fortunately with screening and uh, treatment, um, we can help control many of these um, uh, outcomes and hopefully have a healthy future for both uh, the pregnant patient and uh, their infant, as well as uh, their entire family. So um, we are very uh, grateful for our long-term partnership and collaboration with Joslyn, um, the Asian American Diabetes Initiative, because when I do screen my patients for um, and they're positive for gestational diabetes, one of the first resources I do go to is the AADI nutrition site. And so, you know, th this is where patients can uh, develop their own knowledge before they even see the nutritionist, um, where they can start making their own decisions on better food choices. Um, as you know, many, many Asians like white rice and noodles, and they can immediately see um, the difference when they do cut down on those on those items in their meals. Um, as you also mentioned, exercise is important. And walking is exercise, walking stairs, especially in these cold winters in Massachusetts. Um, sometimes you're not in an environment where you can uh, be outside or be in a safe neighborhood. And so, um, you know, walking in your house, walking in your apartment building, um, walking up and down stairs right after meals uh, can help improve your, uh, your blood sugar. So um, there's a lot of things that patients learn during their pregnancy that they can take going forward into their future um, 
uh, health and care. Uh, Post-pregnancy, we recommend every patient that's diagnosed with diabetes uh, to get a screening to see if they are still with diabetes even after pregnancy. And it's highly recommended that patients continue to work with their primary care beyond their um, uh, pregnancy time so that uh, they can continue to be screened for diabetes even if they don't have diabetes right after pregnancy. Uh, because we do know those who have uh, gestational diabetes do have a higher future risk of developing diabetes. So making those diet and exercise modifications um, can help reduce your future risk or perhaps delay your diagnosis of future diabetes. Um, one other very uh, quick point is in terms of screening, we do screen every patient generally between 20 to 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. But for Asian Americans, um, this is a higher risk uh, population, as well as if you're overweight. And for Asians, that's a BMI of 23 or more. So for Asians who have a BMI of 23 or higher, you know, we should consider earlier um, screening for the gestational diabetes. We might identify and be able to um, uh, have interventions uh, sooner and earlier in the pregnancy. So thank you. I think. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Let me follow up. Uh, so the uh, we've been having discussions about uh, studies into this question of gestational diabetes in Asian American um, people, women. And uh, uh, the reason is uh, both in Asia and in the US, the uh, group of uh, Asians, not all Asians are the same. <laughs> so the particular groups that really should exhibit this high rate are South Asians, uh, Filipino Americans, and Chinese Americans. So is there, whereas it's the Japanese and the Americans and the Korean American actually don't have that spikes uh, from, from some of the studies. Uh, even in Japan, they don't have such a big spike. So, so can you give us some idea why particularly um, these groups are being affected and, and uh, No, I think this is an area that we need further research on. Yes, we'll share. <laughs> Uh, this is the area we need further research on. I don't think it's well elucidated. Um, there's many potential um, causes. You know, is it typically for diabetes? Is it related to BMI? Is it related to di diet? Is it related to environmental exposures? You know, where they where people live, where they work, what kind of air they're breathing. Um, so I don't. I think there needs to be additional research, especially among Asian Americans. Disaggregated data. Um, and I'm, sh I'm sure uh, research in general diabetes will also provide a window for gestational diabetes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so Dr. Gonda, do you want to make a comment on, on, on that? Why South Asians? Uh... No, I, I think this uh, really needs to be studied further. I sometimes wonder whether there's the increased uh, prevalence of insulin resistance uh, in Asians, as is well known. So that could be at least contributing to this increase. What do you think? Yeah, I think the reason I mentioned this, not just for gestational diabetes, so uh, the sort of the after effect of gestational diabetes, the mother has very high uh, uh, risk of de developing type 2 diabetes, and the, uh, the children actually of, also have high rate of developing diabetes. So, so that's why it's so important to prevent uh, uh, the onset. And the other reason I mentioned this is we really need to stress to uh, our funding agencies that we actually need to learn more about diabetes in Asian Americans. And, and this is, again, from many of you are, are leaders that we really need to stress to our local government, national government, NIH. There are very, very few studies based using Asian Americans um, uh, for the studies for the pharmaceutical company I know there are some pharmaceutical people here that Asian Americans are rarely, rarely included in any clinical trials. The reason is 
uh, I've been told multiple times, they do include Asians. The cost of recruiting an Asian American versus an Asian is nine to one. So for Asian Americans, nine times cost to, re to recruit an Asian in Asia. So, so that's the major reason. But you know, Asian American and, and Asian may not be exactly the same, right, from the environment. Okay, so uh, uh, you already covered, Dr. Chi, about the, um, what we could do. Sound like there are plenty we could do to prevent it. Uh, uh, and hopefully uh, we could come up with some new studies uh, in the future to come uh, uh, to actually address the differences. The last question I'm gonna have for Dr. Ganda is uh, the Asian Americans have uh, much more strokes than uh, uh, others and because of high blood pressure and the type of stroke is actually different. Uh, many people don't know, it's called hemorrhagic stroke. There are two types of strokes and hemorrhagic stroke uh, is when you actually bleed into the brain and the other one uh, is not. So uh, uh, that's why many Chinese, uh, Chinese and many other Asians, my patients, are really terrified of strokes. So what is it, is just blood pressure? Uh, uh, is that all, all you need to do? Yeah, so this is a very important question. Uh, let me uh, answer it two ways, uh, uh, two aspects of it. One is, of course, the uncontrolled blood pressure. I just mentioned that blood pressure is often uh, not diagnosed in time, just like diabetes is not diagnosed or high cholesterol. So uh, it definitely high blood pressure is very, very important. High blood pressure can lead to kidney disease and kidney disease superimposed on the high blood pressure is another risk factor. Then there are some other uh, effects that are currently being studied. We don't know for sure, but I want to make one important point. And people come and say that, you know, I heard that statins help the reduce of stroke, but do they reduce the risk of hemorrhagic stroke that you're talking about? They definitely reduce the risk of thrombotic stroke, which is 90% of all strokes. What about the other 10%? who may have hemorrhagic stroke due to high blood pressure. The good news is this has been looked at in many studies recently, and statins do not seem to increase or decrease the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So it all comes down to blood pressure. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, we're gonna bring up two more uh, speakers. If our next panelist could come up as I slowly but surely Oh, actually, what do you need to Yes. <laughs> More slides. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess I will uh, introduce our next panel. But before I do, I do want to touch upon something that Dr. Ganda uh, mentioned, that uh, cardiologists are excited, seem to be very excited about uh, diabetes research and how there's cross benefits uh, across, across health fields. It's something that I've actually been saying for years that the work we are doing here at Joslin, um, the findings and discoveries that, that we have here and the research we do here can unlock cures and treatments uh, across the board. So Joslin's work is vitally important to so many other health issues. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Dr. Ganda. Um, also, um, I noticed as I was running to the back there, um, somebody who, um, who I did not get to recognize a little bit earlier, uh, Anne Lagasse is here. Um, Anne is here in the back. You can stand up and wave, Anne. I'm not gonna let you off easy. Um, Anne is Marty's predecessor as chair, as chair of the board of trustees. And I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the fact that the leadership past and present of Jawson is here speaks so highly and so well of the priority that they place on the Asian American Diabetes Initiative. So we thank all of the leadership for being here today. So thank you again. Just quickly introduce uh, Prasant Beda, who's uh, our chief officer. And a pediatric uh, uh, endocrinologist uh, who will give us a uh, uh, very succinct but important uh, uh, update regarding research uh, and new medications, right? Yes. 
good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. I am going to be brief. I've got three points I want to make, and I don't know when he's going to maybe pull me off the stage with his eyes. So uh, the first is that there's a lot of nuance in how we think about type 2 diabetes and how we might reclassify to really understand the wide spectrum of people affected uh, by this condition. The second is uh, there's great talk about the new medications that can not only help lower glucose and A1C, but also impact kidney and heart disease, which is really important. And I'll make uh, some comments around how uh, this is kind of, uh, if these medications are being used in the Asian, Asian American communities. And the third point will relate to the possibility of uh, reversing uh, diabetes and creating a state that George alluded to, which is called diabetes remission. So again, uh, our prep meeting was canceled, so I did not get the memo on the slides. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the persons represented in uh, shades of red here are supposed to de describe the diversity, which we've known for a long time exists in persons living with type two diabetes and possibly type one. Uh, whether it might be their weight, as was alluded to earlier, whether they're on the spectrum of not making enough insulin to being resistant to insulin and many other factors. So we've known for a long time that type 2 diabetes is really an umbrella term for a very diverse group of people. And the question is, can we cluster them? Uh, and the, this is like a new area of research, which is what I think we wanted to highlight today. So there's this notion that, and we don't need to worry about the acronyms today, we only have a few minutes, but there's this notion that maybe we can kind of cluster people into uh, more nuanced categories. And if we can cluster them, maybe uh, those clusters can help us predict who's going to develop certain types of complications. We know that certain cohorts of uh, persons living with type 2 diabetes uh, are more prone to different complications that uh, Dr. Ganda alluded to earlier. And if we can predict those complications, maybe we can start to think more creatively about what types of lifestyle interventions and perhaps what types of medications are gonna be best suited uh, for those uh, persons with type two diabetes. So we're really entering the world where oncology has been for a while, which is precision medicine. And you can add layers of genetics and other types of uh, information to do this. So there's this uh, effort now to really think critically about subclassifications or just a reclassification of type two diabetes. The early work uh, was done in Sweden, which are the first two uh, kind of columns here. Uh, but it's important for this group to know and for us to present at Ginger Forum that there is important work happening in Asia. Uh, there was an important study that was done in India and three studies in China. And what we see is not only is there important work happening in our communities, but the classifications are different. Uh, so this is very much a work in progress. I think we need to continue to advocate that whether they be in countries that are uh, more homogenous in their makeup or in diverse communities like the US or Europe, that we're really making sure that as George has alluded to probably a few times today, importantly, that Asians are well represented in this work. The second thing I wanted to allude to are the medications. So up until 2008, a lot of the attention in diabetes was, uh, can we lower A1C without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia? And then there was a nod towards what was its impact on weight. And we actually had a pretty good armamentarium of medications that doctors could use to manage type two diabetes. But then in 2008, <clears throat> the FDA required that new diabetes medications uh, demonstrate an improvement in cardiovascular disease. It was not enough simply to lower A1C. You had to demonstrate a meaningful impact uh, in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. And you can see that the armamentarium has increased dramatically. And these medications are quite excellent. And there's at least eight to 10 new classes of medications on the horizon. So now we have to really think creatively, if we're gonna be classifying uh, patients in a more nuanced way, we need to also make sure that we're on top of these medications and how we can kind of use them in uh, communities like the Asian and Asian American communities. So how are things going in our community, a community that we're really thinking about today? There's actually been uh, good progress, uh, more to be done to George's point, but there's been good progress in confirming that they do have real benefit in Asian populations. But are Asian populations getting prescribed these medications? That's the question, right? So if we know that they work, are they getting prescribed? And I've just got, again, two slides. We don't need to worry about the data here. There's some reason, there's good reason to believe that in the US, Asians and Asian Americans are getting prescribed medications. Okay, and that's what this data is showing. And I'm not gonna, for the sake of time, go into all the details, but we are getting prescribed medications to treat diabetes. However, and this is a study that is from London, there's reason to believe that the newer medications are not getting prescribed. The GLP-1 agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors, the ones that are really improving cardiovascular disease, renal disease, early data to suggest in diverse communities 
that Asians, Asian Americans, and this is a European population, are, are not getting prescribed the medications. And again, today we're highlighting areas of research uh, to figure out why these things are happening. We don't have the answer, but we need to think critically about this. The final uh, two slides are on diabetes reversal and remission. There is this notion that um, that's been longstanding for decades. This is not new. That one can actually, as was demonstrated with George's uh, uh, description of his father's course, that we might be able to actually reverse the underlying abnormalities that caused diabetes in the first place and create a state that's called diabetes reversal, where you're reversing uh, the abnormalities. And that's creating a state that's called diabetes remission, where you've been taken off all of your medications uh, and have achieved some measures like an A1C under 6.5% again, as was described uh, with George's personal story of his father. So where are we, again, in the Asian and Asian American community? You know, maybe a decade or decade plus ago, about 5% of people just achieved this, just a matter of course. With the, now there's thinking that with critical attention to lifestyle, dietary choices, exercise, things that have been highlighted and will be further emphasized with our speakers today, that is possible that perhaps 40 to 50% it's a massive number. Potentially 40 to 50% of people could achieve diabetes remission over a long term, if not uh, for the rest of their lives. Again, the foundation for this, because it is remission, it cannot be medications, um, is life intensive lifestyle modifications that has to be culturally tailored uh, to the communities that we're targeting. It may or may not be supported uh, in certain populations with bariatric surgery, uh, but not necessarily. And then there's maybe a role for these new medications to help jumpstart the process, uh, but not necessarily be there for the long term. So really trying to figure out how can we achieve diabetes remission, uh, given the magnitude of the problem in our communities, is going to be a really important area of focus. And there actually is some early work in the Indian and Thai populations to suggest that this is not only possible, uh, but possible at scale. So we really look forward to kind of contributing to this important work. Uh, and with that, I will bring it to an end. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move ahead. So we have Dr. Mark Yu, who uh, uh, is very, very young. <laughs> and, uh, we thought we have a speaker who uh, who was not born before uh, I started here at Jocelyn. <laughs> He's a, a very bright, uh, incredibly bright uh, young endocrinologist, originally from Philippines, and has been in my lab uh, uh, now three, four years, and published a seminal paper uh, regarding uh, with diabetes. So he's going to talk about uh, technology, this uh, great deal of new technology that improve diabetes care. Thank you, Dr. King, and good morning, everyone. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time to talk about everything regarding diabetes technology. So I think for this morning, I'll be focusing on this one important device called a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM and how it relates to um, type 2 diabetes and Asian Americans in, in particular. But before going there, um, I think it's important to talk first about how we look at blood glucose control as a bigger picture. And when we talk about blood glucose control, we actually think about two things. And the first is what most of you are actually, or maybe familiar with, and that is called the A1C or HbA1C. And when we talk about A1C, it actually just means looking at long-term glucose control. And in you know layman's parlance, it just means looking at the entire thing, the entire forest, the growth of trees, which is just looking at the bigger picture. But then more recently, um, CGMs or continuous glucose monitor metrics are also starting to come into the picture. And when we talk about these metrics, we actually talk more about short-term glucose control or day-to-day -day or more acute variability. And this is actually akin to the flowering of annuals like daylilies, you know, um, they're not there for all seasons, one season they're there and then at the end of the day, they're, they're not there anymore. And it's actually important to think about these two concepts as going hand in hand, looking at blood sugar control both in the short term and both in the long term as well. And with that, I know that a lot of us are not um, uh, in the medical field or are not familiar with CGM. So I thought I'd give a quick overview about what CGMs is. And when we talk about a CGM device, we are actually thinking of three components. So we have a sensor, which is the part of the CGM that detects the level of blood glucose. Um, and then you have a transmitter, which as the name implies, transmits what the sensor reads from your bloodstream into the device. And finally, sorry, you have a receiver which is 
um, the, the part of the device that displays the reading. And how it goes all in all together is somewhat like this. So you have the sensor, which is inserted underneath the skin into the subcutaneous um, tissue in which it detects the glucose level that diffuses out of your blood vessels into a compartment underneath the skin known as the interstitial fluid. And that level of glucose is then detected by the sensor, transmitted to the transmitter, and finally transmitted to the receiver as a reading. And we have you know, many um, CGM devices available now in the market, especially for people with type 1 diabetes. But when you talk about people with type 2 diabetes, I think the most, um, uh, the most well used of all of them would be the Abbott Freestyle Libre systems. And of which the newest one is now the Libre 3 system, which actually builds itself as the world's smallest sensor which um, is able to now stream the reading directly to your smartphone so that you can know your glucose level with just a quick glance. So as you can see uh, in the picture over there, it's very small. You can barely notice it, especially if you're wearing a shirt because it's um, embedded underneath your skin and can be covered with um, a layer of clothing. And then um, it just transmits the glucose reading to your device. And um, this is a uh, platform or an interface known as LibreView in which um, you are able to access all your CGM data. And when you open that platform, this is how it looks like in a general sense. You have um, your average reading over here, the percent, percentage of use, and then the number of episodes of hypoglycemia. And then you have a graph here which displays your um, glucose readings over a particular period of time. Um, if you notice, you have sort of like two important uh, cutoff points here, 70 milligrams per DL and 180 milligrams per DL. And um, if you notice, these two cutoff points, 70 to 180, everything within that is actually what's called within range or basically within your target blood sugar. And which means everything above that is above target or above range. And everything below that is below target or below range. And the other thing that you want to talk about or want to look at aside from just being in range is how flat your glucose profile is. And basically you want your glucose values to be as consistent from one day to the other and not be swinging up and down from one day to the next. And that concept is known as glucose variability or day-to-day -day variability. However, despite all of that, we know that and we acknowledge that there still remain a lot of barriers when it comes to diabetes technology and CGM use among Asian Americans. And um, Dr. King may have mentioned um, some of them. And one of them is the fact that um, not only for AAs, but for type two diabetes patients in general, the criteria for CGM coverage, unfortunately until now, still remains restrictive for type twos in that you require at least one dose of insulin uh, per day for, for these patients to qualify. And the second, as Dr. King has mentioned, is that um, for uh, a lot of reasons and for other reasons unknown, there has been a historical exclusion of Asian Americans in a lot of CGM studies. And third, and importantly, is that we also have a lot of cultural and language barriers. Now, chief among them, um, in a recent study that I actually um, penned with some colleagues, um, where we looked at uh, uh, data from NIH, we actually found that Asian Americans were the ethnic group who least reported being treated with respect by providers in terms of diabetes care. And another issue is the fact that, especially for first generation immigrants, we face um, limited English proficiency or LEP. And this is actually a factor that has been shown to contribute to um, a poorer use of health technologies like CGMs. And that is why we are pioneering now a new study on CGMs among Asian Americans here at Jocelyn, in which we are looking for, um, for this particular pilot study, first, a group of 30 Chinese Americans more than 40 years old, ideally first generation immigrants currently residing in the US, um, clinically diagnosed with type twos, has never used a CGMs, with an A1C of more than 7.5 within three months of study commencement and currently using a smartphone. And um, we're dividing these participants into two groups, a CGM group and another comparator group using just the regular finger sticks. And um, we will be running this study for six months um, 
doing these uh, particular procedures at month zero, month three, and month six, and looking at uh, particular outcomes in terms of CGM device adherence and feasibility, um, diabetes knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, quality of life, and finally, also looking at changes in their blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure levels. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you.